let's get this show on the road. Hello, everyone. Hope you're well. Uh, welcome to another edition of Math 1000 um, Pre-Calculus. Hopefully, you guys had a good week. Um, looks like we have about five people missing. Uh, let's hope they trickle in pretty soon. But we are just going to get underway. So at this point, what I will do is I will uh, share my screen. People still trickling in here. Uh, oh. Okay, so things. Hopefully you guys are all seeing my screen and I think that should be okay. Okay, all right. So uh, let's get to it. So first order of business, uh, some public service announcements. People still coming in here. Okay, public service announcements. Next week, we do have a quiz on Monday. It is on Gradescope. It will occur at the beginning of class. And uh, the format is going to be very similar to the last quiz. So it's on Gradescope, uh, pretty much multiple choice uh, or select all that apply type questions. Um, I did receive an email from someone. I don't remember who exactly, but they told me that they couldn't make it Monday because of a religious holiday. I believe there's a Jewish holiday or something on Monday. Um, I did not get a response to that email. Um, at the time that email came in, I had a bunch of other emails that came in and I just, I forgot to respond to that one, but I don't want anyone to feel like I forgot them. So I'll just mention it now, but I will respond personally to that email uh, in a little bit. Um, but yeah, at the moment, uh, the best uh, solution I see to something like that would be that for anyone who has to miss the quiz on Monday for religious reasons um, can take it on the Sunday prior um, because I do uh, put out the answers to the quiz right after. Um, so the answers will be available on Monday. So it's probably best that anyone uh, who can't do it on Monday, do it prior to the class. Um, that being said, let's actually uh, talk about some other things. So yes, quiz on the 28th. Uh, it starts when the class starts. So at 2.30 p.m. you should log into Gradescope and the quiz will be there. Um, the quiz covers lectures four through seven, as a reminder, and uh, these are the topics. So here are the things that you should know, you should be pretty comfortable with when dealing with the quiz. Exponents and radicals, right? So know the laws of exponents. Uh, radicals are in fact exponents, so you have to learn how to deal with those, simplify expressions with them. Um, simplifying expressions in general is another topic. Combining like terms, expanding parentheses, that sort of thing. Special products and special factoring, so difference of squares, sum and difference of cubes. I expect you to know formulas like that as well as apply them. Factoring in general, as well as just knowing the general strategies for factoring. So we covered a lot of different factoring techniques in class. Uh, we covered uh, GCF factoring, factoring by grouping, factoring trinomials, factoring with special products like uh, difference of cubes, sums of cubes sums of cubes, difference of squares, et cetera. Um, so you should know about factoring in general uh, as well as equation. I introduced the concept of an equation. We didn't do too much about equations. I believe equations, I start going into depth on those in uh, lecture nine. So at this point, you don't really have to know everything about an equation, but I might throw in some stuff about solving equations in the bonus problem. However, at this point, you should know what an equation is and what can apply when you have an equation versus not. So I introduced the concept of an equation because when we're going into simplifying and factoring, it is a common error for students to do certain things that are only allowed when you have an equation. So that's why I prematurely introduced equations. So when you have an equation, there are certain things that you can do, which you should be aware that if you don't have an equation, meaning if you don't see the equal sign there, it's not allowed for you to do those things. So for example, if you have an equal sign, you can do something like divide both sides of the by two, right? So that's an option. However, if I just give you an expression without an equal sign, you cannot randomly divide it by two. It's just, it's not allowed. You can multiply and divide by two, and that will be fine, but you can't just divide something by two. So if I give you an expression with a radical, or you can't just square it at random just because you don't like the radical, not allowed. You can square both sides of an equation, but if I give you an expression without an equation, you can't just square it just because you feel like it. 
So that's why I, I introduced equations just to make the distinction. Okay, when it comes to factoring and simplifying, here are some things you're allowed to do, here are some things you're not allowed to do. Turns out when you have an equation, you're allowed to do things that otherwise you would not be allowed um, in other contexts. So yeah, those are the things covered in uh, lectures four through seven, right? Now, the uh, topics immediately following that, lectures eight and nine, this goes into rational expressions and equations. So if I'm putting any bonus material on the uh, quiz, chances are I would put material from here. So I might ask you about simplifying rationals, um, rational expressions or solving equations, things of that sort. Okay, um, that being said, there is an additional technique that I wanted to introduce to you to kick off today's Q&A session. So not really a Q&A, um, I'm actually gonna start by teaching you something new Hopefully it's very easy to catch on with. Uh, it is called the payback method. So when it came to factoring trinomials in class, the, whenever the coefficient of the square term was not one, I spoke about two methods in class which you could use to actually, uh, oh, someone's coming in, let me let them in. Uh, I spoke about two methods in class which you could actually use to factor that. Uh, one was the AC method, which is very systematic. Uh, but it takes a lot more to write down. The other method was a trial and error method, and that's because I don't really know a good name for it. Um, but if you get really good at the trial and error method, I think it's the quickest method around. That being said, a student reached out to me a week or two ago. Um, I, again, I don't remember who, I'm sorry. Uh, but they mentioned that, oh, when in high school, I learned this whole other method, which I think is called the payback method. And so I never heard about that method before. I didn't do it when I was a little Javon, but so the student couldn't explain it. So I looked it up myself. And so this is just another method. So I wanted to just cover this with you guys very quickly. Talk about a new method for factoring trinomials. That being said, you don't have to know this method. You don't have to use this method. You don't have to use any method that I, 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 I say. There are times when I would recommend something to you. But as long as what you're doing is mathematically valid, it's logical, it's repeatable, you have a strategy for it, there are certain steps that you always take in a certain order, uh, I don't particularly care what method you use to solve a problem. So you can do it your own way. If you don't like my way, that's fine. Uh, there are certain reasons why I recommend certain methods, but you don't have to stick to them. So that being said, I'm going to show you a different way to factor trinomials, which is a modification of the AC method. It's called the payback method. But you don't have to learn it. You don't have to even pay attention to the section if you don't want to. But it just might, it might give you another option. So if you like it, you run with it. If you don't, forget it. Go back to what I, uh, we were doing before. Um, but I thought I'd talk about it because, you know, someone brought it up. And it's another method out there. And it's relatively straightforward. So I thought I would just give you guys the option of doing it. So um the nicest explanation i found for this is at the website right here so i linked you to a website that there are not a lot of examples on it but it does kind of explain why it works um and i'm not going to talk about that because again it's, this is almost a throwaway topic um so i don't want to get too much into the proof of why this would work um, but if you're interested you can actually check out that website right there um so what I will do is instead, I'm going to do these four examples that you see on the screen. These were ex actually examples done in class. So that way you can compare what I'm doing here to what was done in class and you can pick your favorite method. Um, at the moment, for the first one, I'm going to explain in detail what I'm doing and why. And then for the other, uh, the other examples, I'll just quickly go through uh, the process of doing them. Um, so that's what we will do for the beginning. And of course, after this, I will open uh, things up for a uh, general Q&A, just in case you guys had any questions, lingering questions that you want to ask me after going through the lecture material. So uh, we are going to do uh, the payback method here. So by the payback method. So here's how the payback method works. Like I said, it's uh, uh, used in lieu of the AC method. So you can use this method whenever you would want to use something like the AC method or the trial and error method. This method can replace those methods, okay? So here's the first thing. 
it's very, it starts out very similar to the AC method. You do find AC, except you actually remove the A from the process. So uh, step one is to remove leading coefficient Is someone else coming in. And multiply the last term. By the leading coefficient. It's very long winded. I'm sure you can say it shorter. Um, but you take the, the leading coefficient and you multiply the last term. But then what you do instead of the AC method, you actually remove the first term. So here's what it's going to look like. So I start out with a 2x squared plus uh, 5x plus 2. What, I would, what that would become now is just an x squared. I would remove the leading coefficient. And I would multiply the last term by that leading coefficient. So this is the AC term. OK, so now I ignore the original problem. And now I focus on this new problem that I just created. Just take the leading coefficient, multiply the last term. And the image is probably fifth on the video, but whatever. OK, so now um, what you would do is you would, uh, step two, factor this new problem. Now you'll notice that this new expression has leading coefficient one. Therefore, the rule that says look for two numbers that you multiply and get the constant term and add and get the middle term would work. So what you can do is you can factor it that way. So for this, it looks like four and one would work. Something else coming in here. Um, so that would be factored. Now, the third thing is this is where the name comes from. At least I think this is where the name comes from. I didn't look up uh, where it came from. But what you're going to do is pay back the leading coefficients. So I took away the leading coefficient. Now I'm going to give it back. I think this is why it's called the payback method. Leading coefficient uh, by changing the x's back to ax, right? So originally I had an ax squared in the beginning and I removed it and just had x. So what we're going to do is we're gonna pay that back that we just borrowed. Uh, so now the leading coefficient in this case was two. So I'm going to, instead of x, I'm going to put back that two x. Now what's going to happen is uh, you'll, you'll get some common terms here. Um, one or both factors would factor further, so do so. Now you notice that in the first scenario, the 2x plus 4 parentheses, there's a common two. I can factor out that two. Okay, um, there's nothing common in the last two. And this leads to the last step. So you'll notice that the thing that ends up in the front, it's always actually going to be the original A or some, some multiple of the original A. Uh, so what you're going to do is you're going to divide by the original A, um, which in this case is two. So you're going to divide both sides by two. And ultimately now you would end up with the answer x plus two times two x plus one. And that's going to be your answer. Okay. So that would actually be the factors of that guy.
So this is called the payback method. And the name comes from uh, this part right here, um, where you borrow the A, but then eventually at some point you have to pay it back. At least I'm guessing that's where the name comes from. I don't know. Um, so now that is a new method for factoring. That is actually the factors. And you can check that with the answer that we got in class. Let me run through it again uh, a little bit more quickly this time. So you can see everything at a glance and sort of see what it would look like in general. Um, with this other example. So this was another one uh, done in class. So let's actually see this one again. So again, here, what we're going to do is by the payback method. So what I'm going to do is remove the six I'm going to multiply the last term by the six. This gives me a new expression, x squared plus x minus 12. I'm going to factor this guy. And it looks like x plus four, x minus three should work. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pay it back. So I'm going to put back the six. You will notice that in the uh, first set of parentheses, two is a common term. And in the second set of parentheses, someone's having trouble getting in here. Uh, in the second set of parentheses, three is a common term. So I can move the two times the three in front. And now, um, just divide both sides by that original six. And that's your answer. So that is what it would look like to uh, factor this guy using the payback method. Now, there are some comments I wanted to mention about the payback method, which uh, this comment showed up just in time. So one thing I want you to notice is that, uh, notice the use of this thing, which is not an official math symbol, um, as opposed to the equal sign or like an implication sign. Um, and that's because these guys here are actually not equal, right? So these are not equal to each other. So it's not like the first thing was equal. I like literally invented a whole new problem that when solving that problem helps me solve the original problem. So it's not like it's equal or it doesn't directly follow from the first line. The second line doesn't directly follow. So it wouldn't be correct to write equal or implies here. But I do want to know, there is a strategy that's happening behind the scenes. And so I, ju I just put like, okay, this leads to this, leads to this, leads to this somehow. But they're, they're not, the mechanism uh, isn't actually clear. So um, the danger of this method is uh, somehow students uh, mixing this up, like we're talking about equalities. We're not. We're literally inventing a whole new problem. Technically here are the x's. Um, in these two lines aren't really X's. Um, those should, strictly speaking, if we wanted to pay attention to what the method is really doing, this should be a whole other variable. And the link that I linked you to explains how to construct this whole other variable and why that whole variable is actually equal to six times X. Um, but students usually, when you're writing it out, you just leave the X there because the X is just a dummy variable. It's just a placeholder anyway, but eventually you have to put it back. Um, so at this point, you don't really need to know that's what's happening, um, but you can't technically write equals, this equals that equals that because it's not equal. You're actually creating a whole new problem. Um, but that's the payback method. That's how it actually uh, works. Uh, let's, let's actually run through it again to make sure that we, we actually see how it works. Maybe I'll have someone else run through it with the last example with me. 
So we can look at this again. So once again, I'm going to use uh, the payback method. So uh, remove the five, multiply it by the three. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to factor that new thing, which in this case looks like it should be a minus 15 and a plus one. I'm going to pay back the five that I took away. The first factor uh, factors further. And then I divide by the original factor that I had paid back in the first place. And those are the factors. So this is uh, called the payback method. Um, so the benefits of this method, it's a lot more contained than the AC method is. Uh, the things that aren't beneficial is that technically there's, there's no equality following. So you do have the risk of forgetting how to go from one step to the other, but with practice, you can solve that issue. Um, one step doesn't always logically follow from the other because there are things happening in the background, especially between lines one, two, and three. It doesn't actually make sense. It also doesn't make sense in line five why you would randomly divide by the five, at least when you're visually looking at it. There's nothing to suggest why you should have to do that. So it's, it's not something that follows step by step, logically, mathematically, like the other methods did. Um, however, it's a little trick, it's a little uh, thing that because of the math that's going on in the background that you're not seeing, it actually makes sense and it'll always actually work out. For more um, information on why it works, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this today because we do have um, a relatively short time together. Um, you can actually read that link. It, it should be very understandable. Um, excuse me. Yes. Uh, do you mind going back to the rules uh, for a quick second? Which one? Oh, sir. So the very first one? Yes, please. Yeah. Did you have a question or did you, are you trying to copy it? Uh, no, I was just going to try and copy it real quickly. Okay. That's okay. Um, yeah, as always, I, I'd, I'd also provide the notes here uh, as well in a PDF at the end. So. Done copying that, scroll down, here's steps three and four. And then here is step five, which is the last step. Um, for step five, isn't it more of just like dropping the original A and not dividing? Or I don't know, that's just kind of confusing. Well, I don't want you to think of dropping because you might not be able to see it. So for example, if you ended up with eight times X plus two for, let's say for argument's sake, you ended up with that, you would move this to a four, right? Okay. You do want to think divide. You don't want to think dropping because if the if the actual number doesn't show up, you don't you won't you're just like okay there's no two here so I'm not going to drop anything. But you'd actually end up in an incorrect situation by doing that. So okay. you do want to think specifically divide by the original a. Okay. Thank you. And and like I said at the link that I I posted earlier here. Uh, it does explain why you divide because the, the process, how this method works is that you actually multiply by the A, you regroup terms so that the new variable becomes AX instead of A, then you factor it. And so you have to divide by the A because originally a multiplication actually happened. It just happened in the background. 
So you do specifically want to think of it as dividing by. Is, is there anyone else who actually learned this method in school? Like, it's not the first time you're seeing this? I did. Yeah? Okay, awesome. Now, uh, for the last one, I guess, just to kind of make sure that we're on the same page, maybe someone who is used to this method uh, can actually let me know how to do this. Or if you've never seen the method, but you like it, and you actually want to try your hand at it, um, you want to see if you would know to do the right thing, maybe you can actually do this problem with me. So uh, let's do this one together. Uh, let's try the payback method if anyone wants to uh, chime in and uh, help me do this problem. What would be the first thing here? Anyone? Um, remove the leading coefficient. Yeah, and do what with it? And then multiply A times C. Okay, so what would that result in? Oh God. So what would the new line look like? Uh, X squared uh, plus 17X uh, plus 72. Okay. Yeah. Then what? At this point, what do we do? Factor that expression. Okay, what does that factor into? So you want two numbers that when you multiply, you get 72, you add them, you get 17. X plus nine. Nine and eight. Mm hmm Okay, what's the next step in this method? Um, put back the 12. So, mm -hmm. 12 so you pay back the 12. Yeah. What's the next step? Um, factor out if you can. Mm -hmm. So in the first, does anything factor out? Uh, three. Does anything factor in the second one? Four. So that's actually equal to 12 times 4x plus 3 times 3x plus 2. And then what? Um, you divide by the right. original. Yeah. Divide by the original 12. And so you end up with 4x plus 3 times 3x plus 2. And that's your answer. And you can check these were the answers that we got in class as well. So this is just a new method called the payback method. So uh, someone suggested it to me. And so I decided to show you guys. Um, just another option. Uh, if you don't like it, you don't have to accept it. Uh, you can uh, keep doing what you were doing. Um, you guys know where I stand. I'm partial to the trial and error method. Um, it's a lot less writing and you're rel you get relatively good at it uh, so that you can do it pretty quickly with enough practice. But if you prefer a systematic way of writing things out and you would like the AC method as opposed to the trial and error method, this is kind of another thing that is similar. So you do have an, another option. So I thought I'd, I would just share that with you guys. Um, if you've seen it before, awesome. If not, it's okay either way. All right, at this point, uh, let's move on to the Q&A session. So as I mentioned, we do have a quiz on Monday. These are the topics it covers. These are the lectures it covers. So based on the material that you consumed uh, during this section of the class or when you were working on any of the homework, were there any issues, anything that uh, you missed, anything that you'd want me to talk about further? 
uh, anything that you were unclear on that you'd want cleared up, uh, now is the time. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I do notice that uh, like some people keep uh, leaving and exiting the room. I, I, I assumed it was internet issues. Um, yeah, other than that, any questions, comments, concerns, issues? Um, I have one question. Yeah. Um, I'm looking through the syllabus now, so forgive me if if it's in there. But yeah. um, on WebAssign, we have a lot of things due on October 19th. Yeah. So do we have to get all those done by October 19th, or are we supposed to be doing only certain things? Yeah, so October 19th is the deadline to get them done. However, it is best that you do things uh, as you go along. So at this point, you should be up to like 1.3 in the homeworks. So I wouldn't wait until October 19th to get everything done that was due on October 19th. You should be doing the homework as you move along. Um, but October 19th, that's the last dead, that's the deadline to get in all the topics prior to that point. So the question was, uh, I guess how homework deadlines work. Uh, so the answer to that is do the homework for each section as you, as the class progresses. but all sections must be done by the respective due dates. So there are two major due dates. Uh, there is a deadline prior to test one, and there's another deadline prior to test two. So the deadline prior to test one is the homework for all topics that would be included on test one. Uh, I would expect you to finish all the homework for all those topics by the time test one comes around. Now, I don't expect you to wait until the day before that to do all the homework and just get it in on the deadline. I expect you to be doing the homework the whole time so that by the time the deadline for that, all those homeworks come up, you're only on the last homework. You would have already done everything up to that point. But that point, if you miss the homework or two, like you have until that date to, to make up anything that you didn't get through. Um, so that's how that works. And then after that's closed, you will no longer be able to do those homeworks. Uh, you have the next set of homeworks and those are cover all the topics that are on test two. And so you'll, you'll consistently do uh, the homeworks as the class is going along, but by the time test two comes around, you should be doing the last homework for the last section for the topics that you would need for test two. Um, in terms of following along, this, this actually came up, came up in the other class, so I think I'll mention it here. And I guess I'll, I'll mention something about that as well in general. Um, so the syllabus, I forgot how to spell syllabus for a second. Syllabus uh, shows topics and sections, right? So the syllabus will show things like, oh, 1.1 is the real numbers. And then it would go into 1.2, which is, well, let me actually make this a little bit uh, accurate. Hold on, let me actually. Exponents and radicals. Uh, yeah, 1.2 is exponents and radicals. Uh, 1.3, this was algebraic expressions. Uh, 
Um, uh, I'll just stop at one more 1.4. This is uh, talking about rational expressions. Right? So this is the syllabus, right? In class, uh, the topic is written on the board as I'm doing them. So I might not specifically write down like what, section 1.2 on the board. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, sometimes I forget. Sometimes when I'm there teaching, I don't remember exactly what section on the book I'm teaching. I just know what topic I should be teaching. And so I would actually write down the topic. So um, I might write down on the board uh, exponents and radicals. Right? So sometimes what I, a couple of students asked me about prior to this is they're not sure where in the homework they should be to kind of match up with where I'm in the lectures. And the best way to do that is to actually just look at the topics that I'm teaching in the lecture and then look at the syllabus for the topic that matches that. And then you do that. So at this point, you'll notice that in lecture eight, the lecture after the lecture where you had to do the quiz, that starts off with the topic of rational expressions. So that tells you at this point, I should be up to 1.3, right? So by just paying attention to what I'm doing in class, you'll be able to know what sections of the homework you should be up to. So uh, by today, everyone should have done the homework for up to 1.3, right? So don't wait until the day before the homework is due to do 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 1.5. Don't wait. You should be doing homework as you're going along. At right now, as of today, you should have completed all the homework up to section 1.3. Starting with lecture eight goes through 1.4. I think after lecture eight, you should do 1.4. Lectures nine starts 1.5. That's where I started equations. So, you know, after lecture nine, do homework for 1.5, right? And that's, that's how you go. Just follow along with the topics that I'm doing in class, L line it up with the topics that are in the syllabus, and just make sure you're doing that section as doing the sections as they're done in class. Okay. Um, so that was, that's something else that has to kind of goes hand in hand with the deadlines for the homework. So you should be doing the homework as I go along in class to know where I am, which homework to do, just uh, match up the topics. Okay. Um, so yeah. Hopefully that helped. Uh, other questions? Oh, and some of that was related, I forgot. Okay, so I'm gonna send out an email about this because I didn't mention it in my earlier class, but since I have you guys here, I can just mention it now. Um, this question here, uh, what, I, what I said uh, down here, I said because that question came up in the last class. So um, I do have Q&A sessions with both of the classes, right? And it turns out the questions between each class might be different. So there might be things that I talk about in the class I had earlier today that I don't talk about here and vice versa. Um, however, I think because it's a Q&A session, it's probably to your benefit to actually watch the Q&A session from the other class as well, because I might answer questions that you didn't think about asking, or someone might have a question that I didn't get through that was, they happened to have asked that question in the other class as well. So it's actually uh, beneficial if you have time to actually go through the lectures for the other class as well that I'm doing. So I'm teaching two sections of this class and you guys are pretty much doing the same thing. You're both watching pre-recorded lectures and then you have Q&A with me. Um, so like I said, the Q&A between the two classes are different. So I'll talk about different things and it's based on the questions that that particular class is giving me. You, it might do you some good to actually cross-reference a little bit, find out what the other class is asking me about and, and it might offer some insight and that class should find out what you guys are asking me about. It might offer them some more insight. So I just, I, I thought I'd mention that that the, the videos that I post for the other class are an additional resource. Um, add some good questions from the other class. I, and uh, this question actually came up in the other class as well. So that's why I just, I kind of preemptively answered this one. Um, because this, this question, how are the deadlines actually working, came up and then someone else asked, well, how do I know 
that I'm keeping up with the homework. And so I had to give this answer. And so I kind of know like it's the same question. So I, I'll give you guys the answer. But it's possible that they ask a question that no one in this class would ask, but it would be useful for you to know that information anyway. So yeah, you can uh, check out the lectures for the other class as well, um, because they would be, it's, it's its own little snowflake. It's, uh, it's a unique experience for each class. Um, yeah. All right, uh, other questions? Um, about the quiz, actually. Yeah. Um, will there be a section where you have to scan like your photo or anything like that? No. So that also came up in the other class. Okay. So a uh, question. Uh, do you have to show scan your work for quizzes? The answer is no, usually not. I can't speak for the future, but at this point, I don't plan to do that. Um, but it is important that you know, you will have to do this on test. So that being said, while it is not strictly required on quizzes, you do still want to practice logically writing down your steps correctly, even on the quiz. Um, and you do want to make sure that you know how to scan and upload your answers or take pictures of your answers and upload them to Gradescope. Um, the fake quiz that I posted way back when had you practice some of these things. So make sure that you're, you have that in practice um, for the tests. So for the tests, I'll ask to see your work and I'll ask you to scan and show your work. Um, but not for quizzes. So it's not required for quizzes, but you should know how to do all these things because when the tests come around, um, that will be required. So that will be required for the test and the final. Thank you. No problem. Thanks for your question. Other questions? For the test, will the time limit for the actual test include scanning and uploading or is it two separate time? It's two separate times. So um, what would happen is the test itself will also be timed and the test you'll have about double the time of a normal quiz. So the test will be about an hour long, an hour and 15 minutes ish. And then I will give you an additional 10 to 15 minutes after that to scan and upload all your answers. And it would, it would be, I'll give you more instructions when the test comes around, but it would be in two separate files. So there'll be a link in Gradescope to take the test. And then there'll be a secondary link where you'll upload your work for that test. And that secondary link will have a deadline that's about 15 minutes after the first thing. So you go into the test, you'll do it. When the time is up, it'll kick you out. At that point, you upload your answers to the other thing, and that thing is going to close in like 15 minutes later. So it's an additional separate time. So you'll have about 10 to 15 minutes separately for scanning and uploading work. So you do want to practice so that you're, you're fast enough to upload all your work uh, within, a, say, a 10 minute window. Thank you. Other questions? No, everyone else is good. We're all great with those topics. 
fully understand factoring um, exponents and radicals, simplifying them, combining them. Go to everything, algebraic expressions. Got through the homework, okay. There was a question on the homework yes. I was able to do, but because it involved, uh, it was something with uh, fourth root or something. Mm -hmm. um, I, you said in for the last quiz that you no calculators or anything. Right. Yeah. Um, calculators are not allowed. But I didn't ha couldn't have couldn't figure out a way to do it. To, you know, because I needed to simplify to get rid of the fourth root, and I don't know how to do fourth roots. So it was like the fourth root of this, a huge number or something? Something, I don't remember exactly what it was now. Yeah, so the homework, you might have a problem here or there where you'd have to use a calculator on, but just know that in a quiz, I would make the numbers smaller so that you would know what the answer is. So okay. let's suppose the number was huge and you wouldn't know how to find the fourth root of it. You can just imagine on a quiz, that number might have been something like 16. So the, it would be obvious that the answer is two. Great, thank you. So if, yeah, so if it's a matter of that where the number is just like weird and it's like, there's no way he would expect me to do this in my head, just know that in a quiz, the number would be a simpler number that I would expect you to be able to do it in your head. But yeah, calculators are not allowed, strictly speaking. I do want you to use your own brain power. Like the, the, the problems will be written in such a way that you won't need a calculator. Like you won't need to compute anything to six decimal places or anything like that. It'll be stuff that you can simplify uh, by hand. Other questions? Okay, I mean, if there are no other questions, we can get out of here. Um, of course, if you have any questions that come up uh, during the week or before Monday, you can email me can try to figure something out. Um, but if there are no questions, uh, you can, uh, I guess we can all go. That being said, you can watch, uh, is the, I think it was uploading. I don't know if it's actually done at this point. But I, I discussed some more problems in the other Q&A. So, I mean, with the uh, extra time that we have, uh, you could go watch that Q&A. You'll probably see some uh, stuff that are, is useful. Yes, it looks like it's up. By the way, you can access the Q&A for the other class on the class website. And the link to the lecture earlier, I just posted in the chat. Um, so you can check that out. Uh, some more questions were asked about the homework. Um, what you can do is just try to answer the question before I answer the questions. Um, and that might actually be a good second check 
as to whether you know how to do uh, what was asked. Okay, uh, but uh, for now, it seems like there are no more questions here, so I won't keep up any more of your time. Uh, thank you for joining. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for all the questions that I did get. Uh, good luck studying this week, and I guess I'll uh, see you guys later. Okay, so take care. Have a good day. And thank you. You're welcome, and I'll see you in the next one. Ciao.